playing hits or something now. I love that song. <laughs> you would say with me one more time. Nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood, Jesus.
There, 435. 
things I shouldn't do to those are what I end up doing. And uh, we try to quote that, we miss it sometimes. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit what, what that means. It's not an excuse for sin. That's how most people use it. I'm going to show you uh, something that you're really not to meditate on and uh, come to a conclusion yourself. Um, but I hope it'll hope it'll be up to you. But tonight we're going to look at something I think it'll be very simple. It's really one just one simple thought that uh, I want to get across to you. We're going to start reading in verse seven in Romans chapter seven. We'll go down to verse thirteen. The Bible says, "What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I have not known sin but by the law." For I have not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. Once you mark the phrase of verse 7, it says, What shall we say then? These four words, Is the law sin? Is the law sin? Now, that that starts out with a boring thought, doesn't it? I mean, that's, that's just, that, that almost wants you to just take a nap for the next little while, right? Uh, I want you to think about this. Uh, last week, I think it was, I asked people to raise their hand and said, How many of you raised in a family or church or upbringing in some way where it was all rules, 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 rules? And that kind of thing, and there were quite a few people. I think about a third of the people in our church raised their hand, and I was one of those. And I'm for rules, I'm for standards, I'm for the law, because the law is not sin. The Bible teaches us, when I just read, the law is not sin. It's actually a good thing. So I'm for it. The problem comes when we try to fulfill it in order to have victory. If I try to do right in order for God to bless me, I'm afraid that there's a generation of Christians who have been taught, and taught another generation, who have taught another generation, and so on, that uh, all you got to do is just do, 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 serve, 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 and you can just get it done. And I'm for working, I'm for serving. Everybody knows me knows that, but I'm going to tell you something. We've got the point where we're trying to do it in our flesh, or we do it for the wrong motive, and it does not work that way. Last week we showed you verses 1 through 6. We showed you that there are three main kinds of people and kinds of view of the law in here. Three, not three main kinds of people. There's the spiritual man. That's who we talked about last week. The spiritual man in verses 1 through 6. The law and the spiritual person. Uh, that person's been delivered from the bondage of the law. So now I'm going to show you the law and the natural man. Now the natural man is the unsaved man. All right? So let me get this right. You help me out. The law, excuse me, the natural man is the what kind of man? Unsaved. Unsaved. Now, I don't, I, I'm not here to tell you you're saved or not saved. That's between you and God. I want you to be saved if you're not. But if you are in these verses, I'm trying to be good to go to heaven. I'm trying to earn my way to heaven. That These verses are for you. Next week, we're going to see Paul probably for two weeks, we're going to see Paul in a light that most people have a hard time seeing Paul in. How many understand that Paul was just flesh and blood, right? He was a man. He was a man. He was a special man, but he was a man. You know, Paul got so discouraged and even depressed that he dropped out of the ministry for two years. He did. He went to Corinth and didn't preach, didn't teach, didn't do anything except make tents with Aquila and Priscilla for two years because he was so discouraged and depressed. Think about that. I mean, that, that sheds some light on the Apostle Paul. They refreshed him and they got him back going. We're going to show you next week the carnal man and the law. 
And I, I think we're going to show you some things that are literally going to blow your uh, foundation to pieces. It blew mine to shreds. I mean, it was, it really shook me. Uh, that really changed the way I see sin in my life and this kind of thing. But the main thrust of this tonight that we're going to see is the spiritual man was delivered from the law. The natural man, the unsaved man, is doomed by the law. Now there's a debate. The verses I just read, verses 7 through 13, the three sections, 1 through 6, 7 through 13, 14 through 25, this middle section, there's a debate out there, is Paul talking about and describing himself before he was saved as a as a, um, a doomed sinner, or is he describing himself here as a defeated saint? Is he talking about what he used to be or what he was in that moment? Well, there's a simple way to figure that out, and I don't know why there's a debate about it, but if you look at all the verbs in verses 7 through 13, they're all past tense. I was this. I have done this. This was who I, am, who I was. This, this is in the past. And so he's talking about himself before he was saved, as a natural man, before he came to Christ. He's dealing with the sinner. Verse 14 through 25, we'll show you next time that the verbs are all present tense. And so uh, as a lost man, the law condemned him. But finally, he got saved, and he came to a point in his life where he couldn't keep the law himself, and even though he tried, and he couldn't get victory by keeping the law, and keeping all the rules, and keeping all the standards up high where he wanted to be. He couldn't do it, so he had to come to the end of himself and his own efforts, and he had to surrender completely to Christ. And that's what's in verses 14 through 25. Verses 7 through 13, we're going to see now you cannot keep the law for justification. I know those are theological terms. I hope you can keep up with on that. It's simple. Salvation. You can't keep the law to be saved. The next time I'm going to show you, you cannot keep the law in order to get victory over sin in your life. These 12 step programs and 10 step programs and 7 step programs and all these different programs are out there for addictions. These, this idea that if you just take something away from a person who's living in sin, then they'll get over it. Totally ruins the whole idea of what the Bible is teaching. It doesn't work. What we have to see is you can, as silly as it is, and we understand this, as silly as it sounds to try to be good enough to be saved, it's just as crazy and as silly to say, I'm going to try to be good enough to get victory over sin. You cannot do that. And I want you to hear that. I want you to hear that. Some of you are a little bit older. Uh, you've never been taught that. You've never, you've never lived that way. And you're still struggling with that. I talk with some of you. I watch you. You're struggling with it. I want you to know that you come to the point of total surrender in this. You don't have to live that way. And there's true freedom in it. I want you to notice here what the law does. And this is just by way of introduction real quick. The law uh, reveals sin. It provokes sin. It condemns sin. The law shows us our sin. Now I want you to think about this. The law shows us our sin. Sin that's in us, or what we're called here in chapter 7, indwelling sin, sin that indwells us in our flesh, rebels against the law. Indwelling sin still rebels against the law after we're saved. And sin, that thing that's drawing us away, that heals our flesh, draws us away, sin uses the law, which is good, to condemn us. I'm going to show you that tonight very quickly, all right? Here's what the law does. First of all, uh, law, the, law, the law exposes, excuse me, the hidden nature of sin. The law exposes the hidden nature of sin. We look at verse, um, look at verse 7. The Bible says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. May I have not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. I don't know, maybe, maybe Paul said, You know, I kept all those Ten Commandments, except for the last one, because the Tenth Commandment is, Thou shalt not covet. And so maybe he was saying, I was able to keep all those other ones, but when I came to that covet one, that's when I, that's when I failed. I don't know, maybe that's what he was saying, because he got real specific there. But one way or the other, we understand that the law exposes the hidden nature of sin. It revealed the sinful nature the sinful nature. You understand, before you got saved, before you got saved, your sin nature was what controlled you. 
the old man, the old man, will yield itself to sin, and that was your boss. That's what controlled you. The law shows us that. You know, here's what we often try to do, unfortunately after we're saved, but really before we get saved, what we try to do is we try to cover our sin, we try to excuse our sin, we try to camouflage our sin, we try to hide our sin. What we know that one that's even worse, I think, is that we we'll say it's we'll say it's wrong, we'll call it a shortcoming, but what we try to do is we try to call sin by a more respectable name. That's what we call it. Uh, we call we call it an affair instead of adultery. We call it sexual orientation instead of abomination to God. Right? Yeah. Amen. We call it don't hurt their feelings instead of a lie. We, we want to be more respectable, so we call it, that's an inhibition. That's a, that's a, a complex. Uh, that's a phobia. That's a disease. It's, it's as bad as this. If you were to take a bottle of poison, and there's a label that clearly states that there is poison in that bottle, and you say, that is so offensive. So you take the label off of that bottle and you put on there something with flowers and a rainbow and sunshine and make it look not so offensive. And somebody comes along and drinks it and they die. Because sin brings death. But we don't want to call it sin. Uh, we need to get to the point to where sin is sin. Don't cover it or camouflage it. Don't ignore it. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't give it a respectable name. The function of the law was to give sin a proper name and expose it for what it is. It revealed the sinful nature. Verse 8 and 9, look at this. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me, all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Talk about revival. There are some Christians, and every lost person, sin is revived in their life. Sin is revived. The law exposes in that hidden nature of sin. It also shows us the revived sinful flesh. Revived sinful flesh. Law is a straight edge that reveals the crookedness of the human nature as a lost person. And in fact, the, sin, the word we use many times in the Bible for sin, another word for that is iniquity. The word iniquity literally means crookedness. The law says, here's the straight line, and here's your iniquity, and it shows just how crooked we were. It shows us that, uh, that we, we are truly, we were truly sinful creatures. That's what the sin was given to do. It forces out into the open all the rebellion of our human hearts. You say, well, that doesn't sound too good. No, that's very good for sin to do that. It's very good for sin to do that. Galatians 3.24 tells us that the main purpose of the law was to take the sinner and bring him to Christ. The law was the schoolmaster, the tutor, the one who would take the child by the hand from the house and deliver them safely to the true teacher at the school. That's what the law does for a sinner. You can't keep the law to be saved, but the law sure shows you that you need to be saved. That's what it's there for. But I want you to get this. The law is a guide before salvation, not after. 
Don't miss this. If you miss everything else, this little part right here, I really want you to take hold of. The law points the sinner to Christ, but the Holy Spirit of God leads the saints in Christ. I am not going to live my law, my life by the law and say if I obey all of these, then that makes me holy. I am to obey them. But I can't do it myself. And the law is not what guides me. The Holy Spirit of God is the one that guides me and leads me in my life. The law doesn't lead us. The Holy Spirit leads the saints. You see, the letter of the law, the old law, the Bible teaches us, kills. But the Holy Spirit gives life. That's from 2 Corinthians 3, 6. It revived the sinful flesh. But the law also exposes, number two, the hideous nature of sin. Not just the hidden nature, but the hideous nature. It's so evil, so bad. Verse 10 says, and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, that's the second time that's mentioned, it's mentioned in verse 8 as well. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and it slew me. Sin slew me. I want you to think about the seriousness of sin. The seriousness of it. You see, when you try to keep the law, here's what's amazing. The law does not reward you for keeping the law. I'll be honest. I've, pulled over, I've been pulled over by police officers numerous times. <coughs> More times than I'm willing to admit. Not lately, but I have been. When I was in college, it was bad. It was real bad. I almost lost my license for speeding. So many times in such a short amount of time. It was bad. It was terrible. You know, I've never been pulled over for a police officer to tell me, you obey the speed limit. <laughs> Even if I obey the speed limit. I've never had a police officer pull me over and say, hey, good job, you stopped at that stop sign all the way. You didn't roll through, you just stopped all the way. And good job, I just want to let you know. They're not going to do that. And yet some Christians are waiting for the law to do that for them. <coughs> That's not what the law is for. The law doesn't reward you for keeping the commandments. It just punishes you for breaking them. I was thinking about this. Can you imagine? And I'm just, I'm just throwing this out there. Don't you military know, guys come to me and say, that's not the punishment. I don't know what the punishment is, and you don't either what it is now. But let me just throw this illustration out, and you don't think you'll get it. I want you to imagine there's a soldier, and he's in the barracks. He's got a temper. And one of his... One of his GI buddies, one of the generally listening guys, is just there, and he's just equal peer, takes him off. And this one soldier, this one private, he, he's, he gets upset, he gets mad, and he hauls off and just decks the guy right in the face. He may get some kind of an attention of some sort, maybe for three days. Let's say a sergeant walks up to him. Yells at him, gets in his face, makes him mad, and that same private bears back and just punches that sergeant right in the face. He don't get three days, he may get three weeks. Now let's say an officer comes up to him. Same thing happens. He hauls back, balls up his fist, and just jacks his jaw. Now he's probably gonna get about three months. Let's say the President of the United States walks up to him. This guy falls back, takes his fist, and just hits the President right in the face. He's not going to get three days, three weeks, or three months. He'll probably be executed on the spot. Yep. Here's the thing. He did the same thing. Same offender. But the higher the dignity, the higher the rank of the person offended, the greater the punishment. All sin is ultimately against God. That's why the wages of it is death. 
It shows the seriousness of it. Can I just stop and say this? I'm glad, and I'm going to get this pretty soon, actually, next few weeks, we'll probably get to Romans chapter 8, verse 1, where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I love that phrase, and I'm going to have to work real hard just to get past verse 1 in one sermon, because there's so much in that verse 1. But I want you to think about this. I'm glad that I do not have God's wrath and condemnation on me, Jesus to offend. But Christian, I want you to hear me good. Well, I know this is about the natural man, the unsaved man. I, I know that. But just by the way of application, let me remind you of something. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God. Sin will bring a can bring a death to you as well. It'll never bring a spiritual death. Because you have Christ's life. And that's secure. But I believe you can shorten your days on God's green earth. If you're a Christian and you continually live in sin. Sure. There's a seriousness to it. All sin is against God. Psalm 51 4 tells us that. They've said against thee and thee only have I sinned. And because it's against God, it deserves eternal condemnation. There's one main function of the law, and that is to show the seriousness of sin. Look at verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy. Look at that. The law is holy. And the commandment holy and just and good. Before I get to verse 13, let me just show you something real quick. Look over at chapter 8, verse 7. Just, just a side fault you better be on. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Why? For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You get that? The law is good. But our problem is sin distorts it in our lives. Sin says you need to keep the law in order to be saved. Sin says you need to try to keep the law in order to get victory in your life. The problem is, if you're going to try to keep the law, and I want you to hear me, if you're going to try to keep the law for any of those reasons, and you're going to try to do it yourself, you have to keep every last one of them. You cannot break one of them in the smallest point where you've broken them all. Amen. You break them once, you've broken them forever. There's no do over on that. It's broken. Verse 13 says, Was then that which is good? Well, what is good? Verse 12. The law is holy, the commandment holy, just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? I love this emphatic phrase over and over. God forbid. He didn't just say no. He said no. God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. I want to show you how the law exposes this hideous nature of sin, the sinfulness of our flesh. There's a seriousness to it, but there's a sinfulness in our flesh. And this will lead us into the next part that we pick up, or will it, uh, next Sunday evening. There are at least, that we know of, there are at least 15 Hebrew words in the Old Testament for sin. Fifteen different Hebrew words in the Old Testament for sin. There are about that many Greek words in the New Testament for sin. We have iniquity, trespass, transgression, sin. That's about it. Four, five, six, seven. There are fifteen of them in each language there. You know what that shows us? That shows us those words. That means it reveals what God thinks about sin in all of its forms. The Bible says again in verse 11, and it repeats, excuse me, verse 8 repeats it in verse 11, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment. The law is not sin. The law is actually very, very good. It's a very good thing. 
For the spiritual man, we have been made free from the bondage of it, as in we understand we cannot earn our way to heaven by being good enough to keep the law, and we also cannot keep the law good enough and well enough in order to get victory over sin. The law was never intended to give us victory over sin. There are a lot of religions out there that have changed it into that, and that was not God's intention, and it's impossible to be done today. But the Bible says that sin, taking occasion, strange phrase, it literally means this, gives the idea of a military base. And it's a military installation. And at that point is set up and it's the starting point or the starting base of operations for an expedition. They begin in one place and they springboard out for further advancement into other territory. But they have to start somewhere. That is taking occasion. Sin will set up a stronghold, a foothold. It will set up a, a base of operation in our lives by using the law, by using the commandment. You know what the law does and what commandments do to us? They provoke us. And not to do good, but to do wrong. It's true. I was using an illustration at lunch today. Think about this. Well, we were painting the walls in here. When we came through and sprayed all this stuff, we didn't put anything up that said, you know, don't touch the walls or anything, but I do know one thing we did. We put a sign on that door right back there that says, please do not enter. I don't know what day I put that up, but I happen to know that the very next Sunday after I put it up, there were at least 10 different people in this room. <laughs> Nobody came in before that part of it. You can put a sign that says wet paint on the wall. Yeah. You, you already got it. Somebody will come by and test, is it really wet? <laughs> Say, oh no, it's just tacky. Oh, it's just not hardened yet. <laughs> That's what the law does to us. Look, when I was younger, I don't do it so much anymore. Although sometimes when I put my GPS on my phone, I'm going to confess this to you. All right? How many of you men, maybe some of you ladies, how many of you men can identify with this? I put my GPS up and I'm saying I'm going to go somewhere. And we're driving. So, for example, I preached in the Cape Meeting out in Missouri this summer. And we went to this past graduation in western Louisiana. And uh, we, uh, Rose, were going with my parents' house a couple weeks ago in Indiana. It was a seven, eight hour drive. And, uh, wherever else we've gone, wherever else we've been. And uh, when it's, you know, it's more than like an hour or two away, my GPS says, here's the miles, miles it takes. Here's how long it's going to take you. And here's your ETA. ETA, estimated time of arrival. That is not my ETA. That is the goal to be. Right. Hey. Brother Chris, you say that? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was like, nah, I bet I can knock, I bet I can shave off. On that seven hour drive, I bet I can shave off about 25 minutes. Brother Billy was like, I'm going to Pretty bad when a seventy-year-old man look at me and say, "You drive that slow?" <laughs> I learned my lesson last year. Coming to Hall County, coming down, what is it, eighty-five or nine eighty-five? I never remember the name of the road. Huh? Nine eighty-five. Coming down, you know, Gainesville, all that area down Hall County. I didn't like that. I was in my truck, and there were some hills. They just kind of slope, and then they come back up, and then they slope. Right where you get all those red lights, you know? And I'm just going down the hill. I put, I tap, I'm in my truck, and I just coast on down the hill. I'm not pushing the gas, I'm not getting the brake either. I'm just coasting down those long hills. Speed limit 65. <laughs> I didn't see the cop. <laughs> because apparently their technology is much more advanced than it was the last time I got it. They a long time ago. He clocked me near the bottom of that hill. I was just coasting. I don't pay attention. Just coasting. I picked up the kids from camp. They thought I'd bounce back and forth from Tennessee. I was tired of me doing it. I'm getting home and I was just coasting down the hill. 
he clocked me faster than 65. <laughs> he gave me a ticket. I looked at it. He told me what machine, what tool, what instrument he was using to clock me. It also told me what distance he clocked me. It was nearly half a mile away. I didn't know they could do that. When I was younger, I would see a speed limit thinking 70. Watch this. I had a car that really that should be doing that. I had 87 Nissan Maxima. <laughs> the odometer stopped at 333,000 miles. I drove it for at least another 150,000 miles. I never changed the oil in it. <laughs> Ever. In three years. <laughs> huh? No, we would actually handle that. <laughs> I put over, I drove over 450,000 miles on that thing when I finally threw a rod right through the engine. At one o'clock in the morning. But I would drive that car thing at 70 miles an hour, 85. I was glorious time when we went out in 2010 to Arizona. We saw the Great Canyon and all this stuff. And I didn't know this, but there's some roads out in Arizona. The speed limit is 85 miles an hour. Amen. I would say, praise the Lord. I was in a rental car and I stole it like I drove it like I stole it. I mean, I was 100 miles an hour down those hills, having a time on my way. See, we see the law and we say, I bet I could beat it. It tempts us. There's actually a part of us, people who are not saved, who study human nature many times, actually have a term for this. And I forgot to write it down. So I'm not going to tell you because it's a big long ten dollar word. It doesn't matter. It's the idea that each one of us has the propensity inside of us to see a rule, and most of us say, I'm going to try to find some way around it, or I'm going to outright break it. That's built inside of every one of us. Some of us are leaning up more in that direction than others in certain areas. But it shows us the sinfulness of our flesh. The law and the commandments, they provoke us. And our sin takes that law. You know, sin perverts everything. Sin destroys everything. It takes what's good, the law. You know, it's good to obey God. Right? It's good to obey the Ten Commandments. When Jesus, when, when Paul told him, when Paul said, flee fornication, that's a good thing. Right? Amen. Yeah. When, 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 uh, when the Bible says, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, that's a good rule. Amen. Amen. It's good to obey the law. The moment the law, the, the moment our, the sin nature that we had before comes and grabs that law and says, okay, Josh Johnson, you obey that and you'll be good enough to go to heaven. That's what he's talking about. The law came to life. Sin made to life, and I died. The sin took what was good and used it for the wrong purpose. He used it to provoke us. I want you to know that human strength is not... I want you to get this down. You need to write this down. You need to know this. Human strength is not God's way to overcome what Paul calls in the Bible, in dwelling sin. We'll get that next week, or we have to in Romans 7. The sin that indwells me, human strength, is not God's way to overcome that. You can't be determined enough. You can't make enough commitments. You watch. Let's get spiritual. You can't read your Bible enough. You can't pray enough. You ever had one of those days where you're just like, I'm praying my way through the day so I don't kill somebody? <laughs> that praying is not going to keep you out of prison. Because we're doing it in our flesh. And the flesh is that enmity with God because it's not subject to the law of God. You cannot, in your sinful flesh, in your own power and resources, overcome that sin. The only power we have 
always resides in the Holy Spirit of God. That's all. So I want to remind you, if you try to get to heaven through the works of the law, it won't work. Amen. Right. Can we agree with that? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now I hope you agree with what I'm about to say equally as much. If you try to attain heaven on earth, or in other words, victory over sin through the works of the law, it won't work. I hope you can agree with that as much as you can say it won't get you to heaven. Because victory over sin is not found in keeping the law. It's found in walking in the Spirit. That's where it's found. So let me ask you something. Are you walking in the Spirit? Right now, in this moment, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Right now. Are you? See, the problem is not the law. The problem is our sinful flesh. You know why it's really easy? Let me just, I'm going to share a secret with you that I don't know if it's going to be good or bad, but I just want to share it with you. Preachers like to get up and preach about do this and this and this and this. And it's all about these rules and these standards and all those kinds of things. And don't don't walk out of here. Don't walk out of here. Some of you, some of you don't walk out of here thinking that I'm against those things. I would I, I keep a short haircut. <laughs> It doesn't touch my ears. So you have no idea what I'm talking about. How many are talking about? Uh, Brother Will, I know this probably happened in colleges you attended. Bible colleges, you ever had a hair check? Length of sideburns, touch your ear, touch your collar, that kind of thing. Yeah. I had that one time. Believe it or not, I actually had to go cut my sideburns back a little bit. They're too long. They went below the ear hole. I'm not against that kind of thing. But just because you have a certain haircut doesn't make you spiritual. That's right. But I'll say this, I still think you ought to look like a Christian. Amen. Amen. What we try to do is most preachers that I know, I think most of them, many of them at least, try to shortcut it. You know, it's easier to get people in church to look right and talk right than it is to be spiritual. Now, if you thought that that was the same thing, you're confused. I'm saying is it's easier to change the outside than it is the inside. Right. And we become Pharisees, as Jesus called them, a generation of vipers that are nothing but whited sepulchers with dead men's bones inside. Well, God only sees the heart. No, he doesn't. He sees everything. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He sees everything. But he does see your heart, and the outside, and everything else. It's very easy to shortcut it and say, if you'll just do these things, that'll make you spiritual. Here's, the, here's what it takes for the long haul. If you will be what God wants you to be by living in Christ and abiding in him and letting his life abide in you, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, produce, let him produce his life in you, no preacher would have to have to get up and tell you how to wear your hair and how to dress and what music to listen to and not listen to. And there would never be another sermon preached on why people want to go to church. 
I would never have to preach a sermon on the family ever again. Because the Holy Spirit of truth would guide you into all truth. Not mad, I'm just trying, I'm telling you the secrets of the trade. It's very easy to get up and find the laws and the rules of the Bible and say, do it. generations, and we are so far removed from this now that it's disgusting to me. Actually, sometimes even discouraging. We've raised up generations of people who are really good rule keepers. Very good people pleasers. but have no experience with God. We take a discipleship book and say, hey, let's meet for a number of weeks. Let's tell you what you need to know. <coughs> That's good. You need to know those things. We tell you what you need to do. That's good. You need to do those things. And no change. None. I wrote changed and crucified, mainly crucified. Because it's more than that. So much more. Legalism is the idea that you can keep the law in order to earn any merit with God. First with salvation, and second of all, any kind of victory or blessing in your life because you're good enough. That's legalism. It's not legalistic, that's legalism, as defined by the book of Galatians. You can be good enough to keep the law to earn merit with God. Legalism has destroyed many Christians and churches. If you talk to me about it, come talk to me about it. Because I don't want you to misunderstand. I have convictions. I have standards. I don't walk up to my wife and to Abigail and Andrew Johnson and say, guys, you think we ought to serve the Lord today? <laughs> no, because this Joshua does what the Bible Joshua does. It says, after me in my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't test the wind. It's just, uh, that's what we're going to do today. I don't do that. You shouldn't either. I'm not going to sit there and say, Andrew, do you think we ought to you know, maybe you shouldn't listen to this kind of music. Do you think that'd be a good thing? Now, I might, now that he's 15, I'll talk to him that way. But when he was 10 years old, I did not talk to him. Say, Andrew, do you really think you ought to listen to that? I was with him and said, boy, you're in my house. You don't listen to that. Get rid of it. They always will push it away. Don't think it has. But I want them to know, and I want you to know, and I need, I need this myself. It's not about what I do, what you do. It's about the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. I'm not going to shortcut it on you. I'm going to give you those, these kind of sermons that are really not the most exciting. They're not glory messages. They're not the kind of things you get up and weep and scream and shout and cry. It's doctrine. It's doctrine. Bible doctrine, pure doctrine. God's word. I want you to meditate on these things and think about it. And then you say, oh, I don't need that. You may need some, may need it sometime. I talked to a young man recently who needed it. He needed it. Can you explain it to him? And tonight, if you're listening, hopefully you can. They can explain it to them. Because there are a lot of people out there, especially in our area, the Catholic and Muslim and Hindu and Buddhist. And my goodness, there's a new one that opened up just down the road from my house. It's a kind of meditation center. I don't even know what it's called. I can't even say it. Some weird name. Like this long. Weird. It's just Thailand or Cambodia or something. Huge place. It all works. Can you explain what the, what the purpose of the law is? And how it's been distorted? You should be able to. 
to a young man I pray for that he needs to get saved. I'm witnessing to him. He thinks he can be good enough to go to heaven. If he dies with that philosophy, he will die and go to hell. He doesn't believe that, but it's true. And I can take what I showed you and show it to him. I did, and he's a little dumbfounded. Like, wait a second, what? I've never heard this before. I know. You need to do that. The law is good, but our sin has twisted it to make it something that would be used for our bad, for our death, for evil. The law did not kill, sin kills. And the law used by, this, by sin in our flesh will cause us to go astray from what the Bible says and do what we like. Our flesh thoroughly enjoys doing something so that we think we actually earn victory in our lives. The flesh loves that. The flesh loves it. And it will ruin your life. It will ruin it. May God help us with this. Why don't you stand together with me, if you would, please. Let's ask the Lord to help us to understand this. We live by the Bible. I have standards. Here's something to meditate on. I have standards. I don't live my life by standards. I live my life by the Bible. Why do I have standards? Because my standards are founded upon my convictions. Where do I get my convictions? I get my convictions from Bible principles and Bible truths. Standards protect my convictions. I have a, I have a, I have a conviction that I should not look at filth with my eyes. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. That's a Bible principle. I have a conviction. I'm not going to look at pornography. I'm not going to look at immorality. I'm not going to look at those things with my eyes. So I have a standard when I use the internet. I have a standard how I'm going to be around the opposite gender. I have a standard for that. Would it be wrong and sinful for me to walk up and hug another lady? Probably not. But I have a standard. Because the Bible says it's good that a man shouldn't touch a woman. Now I got a woman. Believe in that. I love her. Now I'm going to put my hands all over somebody else. But I don't live by standards. I live by the Bible. And you should too. I'm poor standards because they protect my convictions based on the word of God. Let's pray and ask God to help us to do this. Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves to you now. We commend our lives to you. And surrender. Lord, I pray that tonight if there's someone here who has taken control of their own life, they have made the decisions for themselves instead of the Holy Spirit being in control. I pray that they will repent of that sin tonight. I pray that they will relinquish all control to you. I pray that they would realize they are crucified with Christ, but the life they live now is Christ's life. And I pray that they would reckon that to be true for themselves. And as we leave from this place, may we rest in that truth. May we walk in total surrender this week. May we walk in the Spirit and be filled with Him. Lord, I love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for doctrine that we can study. And Lord, even though it may not be the most exciting thing that would really just get us emotionally stirred, but Lord, the truth is the truth, no matter what it may do to us. And I pray that we would receive it wholeheartedly in a way that we can remember it, live it, live it, and share it with others. Lord, I thank you for our church family. I pray that you would help us as we live for you and serve you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight.